The weekly Industry Angel podcast hears from business leaders and entrepreneurs who share their stories and that all important light bulb moment. This can inspire us all, maybe scratch that itch, and kickstart that idea that keeps you awake at night. Hi, welcome to episode 14 of the Industry Angel. Today's show is sponsored by the team behind Phil Mustard's Benefit Year. Durham and England cricketer Phil will be working tirelessly this year to raise money for his chosen charities. The Children's Heart Unit at the Freeman Hospital in Newcastle, the Chronicle Sunshine Fund and the PCA Benevolent Fund. There's a full year of events for you to support, invite your guests to. There are dinners, golf days, cricket matches, race days. Just head over to colonelbenefit2016.com for the diary and you can also join the mailing list. So help the Colonel's charities and have a great time whilst you're at it. Today we have the global adventurer and author of The Ultimate Triathlon, James Ketchell. Hello, Captain Ketch. Hello, Ian. How are you? Thank you for having me on the show. Excellent. I'm great. Thanks. James, firstly, I'm going to bring our listeners up to speed on your achievements. Is that okay? Of course it is. That's a good idea. Right. Excellent. So in 2010, you rode single-handed across the Atlantic Ocean in 110 days. That's right. You might remember that yeah, one. I couldn't afford to fly. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> in 2011, you reached the summit of Mount Everest. You were then hospitalized back in the UK with a lung infection. In 2013, you departed Greenwich Park and embarked on an 18,000-mile unsupported around-the-world cycle through 20 countries, cycling on average 100 miles a day. And last year, you and your fellow scouting ambassador, Ashley Wilson, set out to row 3,600 miles across the Indian Ocean. The expedition ended 200 miles off the coast of Western Australia when Ashley sustained a serious head injury during a storm and needed to be rescued. Oh, that is something I will not forget, yes. <laughs> I, I bet. Yeah. Well, you are indeed a global adventurer, James. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Actually, um, crikey, two months ago, I was, um, you know, I always thought lightning will never strike twice and two months ago I was in the Atlantic Ocean I was sort of working really I was taking a guy across the Atlantic in a custom-made pedalo now it's not the type what? of thing you would see on Hyde Park yeah, it's pretty the ones with the little slides yeah, off the end I wanted a slide but we were not allowed <laughs> one and it was a real bespoke custom boat it was brilliant and um, unfortunately we were halfway across and uh, he became very ill as well so that ended when uh, we had to get rescued. So, uh, you know, twice now I've been rescued, but uh, I seem to be very good at helping other people get out of precarious situations. But, uh, yeah, you know, I've got another project coming up in the summer, so and I'm doing that on my own. So I hope it's right. third time lucky. Uh, I think so, yeah. yeah. You must have them on speed dial one, I think, now. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all good. <laughs> So, James, obviously those achievements are documented in your new book. Yeah, it's um, the, the whole book is, you know, I set out to write this. In fact, I wanted to write the book two years ago when I got back from cycling around the world. And it, it's actually one of, it took me quite a long time. Um, it's 105,000 words and I was determined to write it myself. I didn't want to sit there and be interviewed by someone and, and then they they write it for me. I'm not in any way taking anything away from anyone who, who does that. Some people don't have the time or the capacity. I was just determined to write it. And uh, yeah, it's a really great feeling that now it's, it's, it's done, it's finished, it's out there. And the thing, you know, people have started reading it already and I'm just thinking, are these people reading this book? Are they just being too polite? Because no one, as of yet, has said, nah, I didn't really like it. It hasn't done anything for me. So I'm, I'm waiting for someone to say, yeah, I didn't like it. <laughs> but so far, it's been great. The reception that I've got has been really overwhelming because, you know, I can stand up on a stage and I can talk about you know, the things that I've, I've been up to over the past few years. But you don't really know, you know, can I write a book which is a good book? I don't, you don't really know until you try. But um yeah, it's brilliant. No, well, there's it. nothing you can't do by the sounds of it, James. Oh, eh? hey, look, you want something <laughs> enough and you're prepared to give it a go. And it's funny, I've, I've got this mindset and I tell people this all the time. And I learned this mindset from being in the Atlantic. And 
I remember when I rode across in 2010, generally you do it with sort of someone else, like a two man or a four man or sometimes an eight or a 10 man. No one would do it with me. So I, I, I don't know why, but I did it on my own. And um, I had this mindset that I was in this huge ocean. And as long as I did one thing and that one thing was to just keep going, as long as I don't row in circles, by default, I'll make it to land. I will run out of ocean at some point if I just keep going. And then I can assure you that concept, you can take that concept and apply that to anything. And it, that concept will never, ever fail you, honestly. That concept got me up Everest. It got me around the world. And it brought me all the sponsorship in that I needed to get in. Just, just don't ever, 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 ever give up. That is the only difference for me, now some people may disagree, for me that is the only difference between someone who, you know, appears to achieve quite a lot and someone who maybe doesn't, you know, do so much. You don't have to be a smart person, you just have to be someone who just simply doesn't give up. That's certainly a point. I think, James, anyway. what, and I was going to say, James, what, what I mean, what you often say is that it's the starting that's a hard part. Yes, very much so. It's, and it's, it's, Having, I suppose, the human beings are programmed to stay within their comfort zone. So stepping out of your comfort zone and, and doing something new and going into the unknown, you, the human brain is not programmed to do that. But if you stop, take a step back and think, well, OK, I want to achieve this, but I need to do this, this, this and this and break down what you're trying to achieve into little chunks and you just keep working on those little things, ultimately it all comes together. And once you've taken that first step, that is in some way you've made a commitment to do something, whether it be, I don't know, set up a business or climb Everest or row a boat or across the Atlantic, whatever. You've made that commitment to do that. And all you've got to do is just keep going with all the little jobs that you've broken down that will get you to that ultimate goal. It's just having the guts, I suppose, to, to take that first step. Certainly, that's what I think anyway. James, if we take your, um, your Atlantic trip, mm. 100, 110 days, I think it was. Yeah. If, you, if you're going to break, do you, do you sort of break it down into little chunks, weeks? I mean, how do you do that? <laughs> but, I mean, firstly, I shouldn't have even been out there for that long. Um, it, right. Generally, it's sort of an average time to row a boat solo across the Atlantic is about 70 to 90 days, something like that. Now, in 2010, there was a massive volcano that erupted in Iceland and uh, it chucked up an ash cloud and that um, grounded sort of flights all the way around. It, it made it quite difficult getting there on time. But one of the things that, that, that did sort of have a huge impact was there are a lot of low pressure systems uh, in, 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 the, the, uh, in the, the weather system that particular year. And what happens is these low pressure systems, they switch the wind direction and they blow the wind back. And so instead of being blown across, I was blown back. And wow. what should have taken, um, gee, you know, 70, 80, 90 days, took, yeah, it took 110 days. But um, you literally, you just take it day by day. If you can survive the first three days at sea, I promise you, you, can, you will be able to survive three months. After three days or maybe maybe a week at most, it is all in your head, the rest of it. It really is. That, you know, rowing an, an ocean, some people may disagree, but it really doesn't. It's not a physical feat. It's a mental feat. Anyone could step in a boat and row an ocean tomorrow. If you're not very fit, you just row a few hours a day and then you just start building up and up and up. And believe you me, after a couple of weeks, you will know how to row you'll drop weight, you'll get fitter, and you'll get stronger day by day. And every day that I spent out there, I knew I was getting stronger. I was getting closer, I was getting physically stronger, and I was getting mentally stronger as well. And it's really funny that I ended up climbing Everest because I actually broke the Atlantic down and I looked at it like a mountain. I thought, well, all I have got to do is get to the halfway point. If I get to the halfway point, that is the summit, that is the top for me. And then all I've got to do is come down the other side. Once I get to the halfway point, I know that at that point, the currents actually get stronger and they put the current 
The North Equatorial Current is a huge mass of ocean that just flows all the way across to the Caribbean and, and it pulls you along. And as you get further to the west, so closer to the Caribbean, the winds improve. So they're much more consistent. So I just thought, get to that halfway point and things will get much easier. You're then closer to where you want to be. So you really have left, you know, the start in the Canary Islands behind. It, you are closer to, to where you want to be. And that, from a psychological point of view, makes a huge, huge difference. And I rode for 12 hours a day. Uh, I broke it down into shifts. I rode for four hours. Then I had an hour off. Then I had another four hours. Then I had another off, hour off. Then I rode for... At, sometimes I didn't row for the last four hours. I may row for, for two. So I averaged between 10 and 12 hours a day. Then I'd sleep at night and you just used to let the boat drift, really. The currents and the winds tend to blow it the right way. <laughs> tend to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> most of the time, it's just every now and then you'll get a weather system that will come through and it will last for maybe two weeks. So for two weeks you might get blown back but there's things you yeah. can do to minimize that you can drop something called a power anchor which is a big parachute that sits in the water and as the boat's getting pushed back it creates drag just like how a parachute works so it just slow it, you, it doesn't stop you from going backwards it just slows that process down so, uh, minimizes your loss of ground basically so yeah and believe you me that is when you will find out when you really want to be there or not and and there's nothing sure. you can't just get out and walk home and when you're caught in a storm being in a small five meter long ocean rowing boat it's like being on a roller coaster ride but no matter how loud you scream it's never going to stop <laughs> it's really interesting you said your mental strength got stronger and i'm trying to think how did how do you find that how did you get that feeling that you were getting stronger because i knew uh, i knew that every day was a day closer and i knew that my body was adapting as i as as time went on i was getting fitter i was getting stronger and i was i was surviving if you like the, initially when i first started like the first few weeks i was very apprehensive you you, you everyone would question themselves at some point and, and you start to think oh gee can I do this I'm not really sure but I'm doing it and you just you just you you do you get stronger as um as as time goes by and you're surviving and you get to a point and and I'm telling you this is this is what happens when you get to the halfway point the reality kicks in you think I'm really really going to do this because at the beginning rowing 3,000 miles on your own you can't really comprehend that. It, you can't even visualize finishing when you're only covering maybe 30 or 40 miles a day. It doesn't take a genius to do the maths. You're going to be out there for quite a long time. And it just doesn't, it takes quite a while to sink in what you're actually doing. And you go through these different phases when it hits you what you're doing. You, you know, you can sort of think, oh, crikey, this is crazy. And then you kind of go through that, well, okay, keep going, keep going. And then you get to the halfway point. Then you think, wow, I'm really going to complete this. Wow. Then your mind changes. Then you really want to be out there. So once you get to that halfway point, things get much, much easier. You become extremely motivated. You want to row every day. You don't want to go to sleep. You want to get up and row. Because mm. all of a sudden it's become, it's not real in the beginning because you're too far from your goal to visualize what it's going to be like. But when she, once you get closer to that goal and you start to realize, I'm really going to do this, it's, it's all, being out there is just awesome. You wake up every day super motivated and um, you just, you want to eat as much as you can to, to keep your energy up and you don't want to be sitting there doing nothing. You want to be on the oars because every stroke and now that is an amazing feeling i'm quite often asked oh you know what's the best feeling you've ever had was it standing on top of everest or, or what was it the, the the best feeling that i've ever had and i don't think i'll ever be able to replicate this maybe something that might come close would be perhaps one day having children oh, i don't know that's not really in my destiny um when i rode into antigua in, into english harbor after almost four months of being on my own and, and I saw everyone and 
you know, my, yeah. my parents weren't there because the flight was was grounded due to the um, due to the uh, ash cloud and things. And, but somehow the word had got out <clears throat> to to the locals in in the Car- in, in English Harbour that this lunatic from Britain who'd been <laughs> out on his own for all this time was about to row in, and there was hundreds. I mean, hundreds of people everywhere. And it was like being a celebrity for a day. You know, guys were coming up to me saying, oh, uh, can my wife have a photo with you? It doesn't happen anymore for some reason, but it was, it was, it was just unreal. And I, it must have been the, the lovely blonde hair and the beard that people like. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> but that feeling, I've, to this day, I've never experienced that feeling again. It was right. uh, unreal, very difficult feeling to describe. But I guess it was probably a feeling of, you know, I guess in order to... Um, explain to someone what that feels like. I would probably say, think of something that you want to do and work towards that for, I don't know, three or four years. That's how long it took me to, to get the road off the ground and get ready. And, and, and think about that every day and, and get yourself out there and do it. And once you've accomplished that goal, that's kind of what it felt like, I suppose, to be to, to, to arrive in Antigua it was it was a crazy feeling that's a great way to think about it and especially some of our listeners who are in the business world I'm sure three and f- three or four years goes by and, and looking back they would never have thought they would get to where they are yeah exactly so that feeling yeah. of them succeeding you know wow I've now gone from you know having one employee to 200 and we're turning over I don't know 10 million pounds a year that feeling of, of achieving that would it would be similar to probably you know me arriving in Antigua be sure just an amazing thing you know you mentioned there about getting to the halfway points mm. across the Atlantic and it being similar to reaching the summit maybe mm. and breaking it down talking about Everest are, are some of the base camps or do you do you, do you tick them off in your mind I've made it here I've made it there hey, is that that's really interesting what you just say because that is exactly exactly how I broke Everest down there's I climbed from the south side so you have uh, so that's via Nepal you've got you've got base camp you've got camp one camp two camp three camp four and the summit so it's not a simple case of just rocking up and making your way up and down the camps you, you've got to go through a series of climatization climbs so you arrive at base camp then you'll go up to camp one spend a the night there come back down to base camp, have a little bit more rest. Then you'll go back up to camp one, but you'll bypass that. Then you go on to camp two. You'll stay there for a night, then come back down to base camp. Then you'll go back up to camp two, maybe stay there for another night, up to camp three, stay there for a night, back down to two, back down to base camp. And you're thinking, why on earth are you doing that? But you're given your chance. Uh, you're, you're, you're giving your body a chance to adjust to the lower levels of oxygen as you start get, getting higher. I can tell you there is absolutely no shortcut to the top of the world, just like there's no shortcut. So I guess anything worth having um, and the day it's easy to stand on top of the world will be, I think the day a chairlift is installed and that's probably not going to happen. <laughs> for, and so I wouldn't have thought in our lifetime. Um, so yeah, that is, that is exactly how I went about it. I, I remember when I arrived, it's quite funny because to, to get out to Everest, you have to fl- fly into a, a little airport called Lukla, which is one of the most dangerous airports in the world. It's cut into the foothills of the Himalayas. It's a very short runway. There's there's no room for error. If the plane lands short, you're going to smash straight into a cliff. If the plane comes in fast, you're going to hit the rocks at the end. And, and I was quite nervous because before I flew in, uh, one of the planes crashed a few weeks before me. You know, and it was a real, real nasty accident. And I just thought, Christ, I hope that doesn't happen to me. And luckily I was okay. Um, but to get out to climb the world's highest mountain starts with a trip into the world's most dangerous airport, which I thought was quite interesting. So, you know, first of all, I was like, right, arrive at Lukla in one piece, then trek up to base camp, nice and slow, nice and steady. There's a lot of, believe me, there's a lot of testosterone floating around out there. And, I can and, imagine. And what you do not want to do is get sucked into that. You're going to yeah. have a lot of people trying to race up to the front. You know, you've got people boasting about how many marathons they've been running here, there, and everywhere, and how fit and how psyched up and how they're going to smash it. 
But yeah, ev- tr- you know, Everest is a real leveler. You know, something that I learned out there, and that is never ever judge a book by its character because the guys who I thought, you know, in the very early stages who were flying off ahead and, and appeared to be very, very fit and strong, they actually fell by the wayside as we got higher up and things got harder. And it was the people that just kind of kept themselves to themselves. You know, they were nice people. They just cracked on. They weren't racing off at the front. They just, just plodded along. Those guys were the guys that actually started to get stronger and, you know, excelled. And uh, I remember there was a, an el- I say elderly, there was, well, she wasn't really an elderly woman, but there was someone in her 50s who was out trying to summit Everest. And she was using our base camp facilities and she looked very, very weak to begin with. She went on oxygen very, very quickly. Usually most people go on oxygen around sort of camp three upwards, which is about 7,000 meters. But she was on oxygen way before that. And I just, you know, quietly thought to myself, you have not got a hope in hell in getting to the top. But blow me down. She did. She just kept going and just plodded along at her own slow rate. And she got to the top when so many others didn't. It was it was really interesting out there watching how people, some people come to the front naturally and, and some people, you know, don't. It's, uh, yeah, it was really interesting. I learned a lot. So for me, though, the hardest part of Everest was actually getting out there. It's really climbing it is it's not technical at all if we brought Everest down to sea level you and I could run up it it's really not that difficult it's just the fact that it's so high everything is so difficult because of the lack of oxygen that is you have you have also got the ice fall which is a particularly dangerous part of the climb Um, that is very treacherous but apart from that the rest of it's relatively straightforward but, um, you know, it's over fairly quickly, you know, from door to door, me leaving, you know, my house and getting back home. I think I was only away for sort of six weeks. And you're with right. other people when you're out there. So if you compare that six weeks to spending four months on your own, it's just totally, totally different. But certainly getting there was difficult. Um, I, I needed to raise, crikey, I needed to raise the best part of £30,000. And I'd, just for Everest, yeah. Yeah, just for Everest, and oh. you know, I'd, I'd raised some sponsorship and stuff for the row. That's how I managed to make that happen, and I got quite lucky. Um, but I thought, oh, gee, I, I don't know how I'm going to do this, and I, I kind of went back to that mindset. Well, well, I, I got across the Atlantic by just keep not giving up and just simply by keep going, really. So I thought, if I take that mindset and apply that to trying to raise funds. It doesn't really matter whether it's sponsorship or funds for a startup funds for a new business or whatever, whatever it is. If I just continue on a daily basis to send out hundreds of emails and make as many calls as I could in a day. And it was funny because I, by accident, became this default salesman and <laughs> I was chasing things down every day. Um, I never, ever gave up. And it was, let me tell you, it was so demoralizing for months and months and months. I wasn't getting anywhere. And I just rode across the Atlantic. So I had a, you know, had a fair bit of credibility behind me. Sure. But one day I had a lucky break. This guy from Ben Sherman, uh, they make shirts, Ben Sherman shirts. Got, I, I got a reply from him. And he said, listen, I, I can't really do anything for you. But, I, I, you know, I thought, I think what you're doing is great. But the one thing that I can do apart from giving you money is, um, is I can give you this spreadsheet that, that our marketing people use. I shouldn't really give it to you, but I feel that this could help you. And it was basically a database of nearly 500 CEO, managing director, marketing director, email addresses. And he said, look, this information, this is like gold dust. And I said, you know, he said, well, just email all of these people and, and see where you get. But, you know, don't don't mention anything about my name. <laughs> you just you just blew that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I said, right, it's, it's fine now. He'd probably love to hear the story. <laughs> but uh, it's never come back on me. But um, so I did. So I literally spammed all these people and 
I got to, I didn't really get a, a great deal of replies. I got to the last one though, and it was a guy called Andrew who was the marketing director at, at uh, Nando's. And I was like, you know, we all know who in the UK, you know, they make great chicken burgers. Most people know who Nando's are. I just thought I can't really see the connection between climbing Everest and, and Nando sponsoring me. I, I don't I don't know why they would. But I thought, well, if I don't send the email, you know, so I sent the email. And literally, I kid you not, half an hour later, the phone rang and it was this guy called, you know, called Andrew. And, and he said, James, and I'm not kidding you. These were his words. He said, James, I've just got your email. This is bloody wicked. But tell me one <laughs> thing. Do you actually eat Nando's? And I was like, yeah, I love them every day. <laughs> but I can, I can, Morning, noon yeah, and night. <laughs> but I can only eat lemon and herb chicken burgers, which is true. I can't have anything hot. And I'll put my hands up and say I'm, I am a big girl's blouse. I can't <laughs> eat anything hot. So, uh, you know, and, I, and the guy said, well, hey, that's crazy. You, you rode the Atlantic and you're going out to Everest and you can't eat our, our hot sauce. And I said, yes, that, that's correct. And he said, I love the angle. And I, I ended up becoming, they ended up, sorry, becoming my title sponsor. I had to become Barcy the Chicken, which is their mascot. And they trapped me up and down the mountain. Yeah, thankfully, I didn't have to dress up as it. But, uh, but I look but honestly, well, I, I, I kid you not, I was not going to send that email. But I look sure. back at that and I, you know, it's, it didn't take me long to realize that actually the time that you can't be bothered to do something, but you make the effort to do it, I can almost guarantee will be the time that's good comes off the back of it so there's, there's many there's many a sales call i'm sure a lot of us listening now who have done james and, <laughs> and had that very thing it's fate it's mad isn't it when you when you think about what's you know how things just pan out yeah it is and i i don't know maybe some people will disagree but i personally believe if you want something so badly and you you are so stubborn and you just will not give up honestly you will always get it in the end always it's it's very easy to say, oh, this is not happening, that's not happening. But ultimately, if you take control of a situation and just just get cracking and never give up, you'll always get there. It might take you two weeks, it might take you five minutes, or it might take you three years, but you'll always get what you want in the end if you just 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 kind of keep plugging away really fantastic you know your book james has it got all these has it got all these stories in because i want to know so much about everest but i don't want to blow the book hey listen right at the book okay the exciting thing about the book is yeah it's got all of the stories but it actually has all the stories that i really want to tell you now that <laughs> probably just not appropriate for a you know a public right. podcast. I'd, I'd love to but uh, in the book, there are some funny, funny stories, especially yeah. a night out I had in Singapore when I was cycling around the world. And there was, an inc- there was also a couple of incidents on Everest, which uh, some people might find quite funny, uh, in, yeah, involving toilet roll being stuffed down my pants. It was just funny. <laughs> yeah, and you need to read the book. <laughs> yeah. So, James, you've just mentioned the ride there, and I, and I think it you said something great earlier and it was about the fact where you're on a boat, you can't just step off. You're on Everest. You can't just step off when you're on your bike. I guess you could do. Yeah. I, I, yeah. You're, you're so right. When you're cycling around the world, it, your, your environment is changing daily. Believe it or not, a part, uh, one of the things that I did do is I spoke in a school in every single country. Cause I do a lot of work with, with young people and I'm an ambassador for the scouts. Um, so, I, I managed to achieve that and actually spoke to over 10,000 young people as I went around the world. But apart from that, I didn't interact with that many people. You're just interacting with people in passing. So the guy in the garage where you buy your food from, maybe a guy in the motel where you stay one night, maybe a guy who's riding his bike and you ride past him or he rides past you. So, yeah, believe it or not, I didn't see, apart from the, the people that I was actually meeting in schools, I didn't come across that many people that I actually spoke to. But the people that I did meet, it was just amazing. Uh, so I was, you know, sometimes I met someone out on, 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 who was cycling on a bike and I just got chatting to him. And um, 
you know, he was like, oh, well, if you need a place to stay tonight, you can stay at my house. And I was like, wow, that's kind. And it, it was just unbelievable. Like, literally, I kind of piggybacked across America, um, just sort of staying with people that I, I, uh, I sort of met on the road. But outside of that, you, you don't really see anyone. And is that the most memorable country, James, America, you know, in terms oh, of different dang, states and they're, they're, countries they're within all, countries? They're so different. And a country is, is – what makes a country is the people. And I've got to be really honest. Every single country I passed through, you know, the route took me from um, London down to Istanbul, uh, Pakistan, uh, Iran, Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka, um, uh, Thailand, Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, across Australia, right the way across America, then up from Lisbon all the way back up to, to London. So yeah, I passed through loads of countries, but they all oh, every single country was brilliant. Everyone I came across was was great, and I, I do have a soft spot for America, though. I I, I really do. I, I feel quite at home out there, and. Um, that, 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 that I had a lot of memorable experiences in Australia, uh, in America. But, you know, yeah, also you know, people in Australia, I had, uh, hey, you need to read the book because someone <laughs> threw something at me in Australia. Okay. And, uh, yeah, you'll find out what it was. It was not very pleasant, believe you me. Out the window. Uh, ah, literally threw something at you. I thought you were going to tell us a good value bomb, a great tip to take a win. Uh, literally, someone threw something at literally you. Literally, someone threw something at me out of a truck as I was cycling right? in Australia. But uh, yeah, yeah, so it wasn't very pleasant. But anyway, um, so apart from that, Australia was great. Um, India was brilliant. I did quite a lot of work in India actually whilst I was uh, out there. I spoke in, in I think five schools while I was out there. In, in... Was that something you just sorted out when you were there, Jim? I, had, did you some give them I had heads up. People help me with that. Um, yeah. Although I was the guy cycling around the world, there was a team of people helping me in that. You know, I had sponsors that had believed in me and, and helped me make it happen. When so many other people were like, "Yeah, good luck. We can't sponsor you, but good luck." And every now and then someone will come along that will take a punt on you. And that's mm-hmm. why I didn't want to let these people down. That's why I, you know, I managed to get around. There are times where you kind of think, gee, what am I doing? But for me, you think of the people that have helped you. You don't want to let them down by saying, well, yeah, I've come home now because I didn't really like it or I was tired and I couldn't really do it anymore. It wasn't what I thought it would be. So um, I was the guy sort of taking all the glory for it, especially when I got back. But actually, that wouldn't have been able to happen if it wasn't for a lot of people behind the scenes. Sure, they can't cycle around the world and probably don't want to, but their contribution that that, that it was effectively what made it happen. So um, yeah, I, I I'm always conscious of that. You know, you see on TV, you see all the glory of people achieving things, but you generally can't achieve stuff. There's only so much you can do on your own. I'll tell you that. If you really want to take things to the next level, you've got to be able to get a good team around you and get people that you trust and people that that can help you. And that's the only reason a lot of stuff came together because I was lucky enough to sort of come across people that um, that helped me, you know, not just financially but gave me advice and was setting things up for me and just doing intros for me and just made things a little bit easier. And no doubt also in the back of your mind, James, you're going to be thinking of some of the charities that that, that you'd be helping along the 100%, way. 100%, yes. Uh, I was raising money for a wonderful little children's charity as I cycled around the world. And that was really important. So, you know, it was it was one of these things, the more people knew about what I was doing, I had no desire to be a celebrity. I hate that kind of celebrity culture. Um, but the more people who knew what I was doing, the more we would raise for the charity. So, yeah, you, you need that. Yeah. And I know you've got, you've got another project on the horizon. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, I am rowing a boat around Great Britain this summer, uh, nonstop, unsupported. So I can't get out every night. I have to, it's almost, you see, people think, well, that's, that's not such a big deal, right? But actually, it's almost 2,000 miles to row around Great Britain. I'm right, wow. From, from St. Catherine's Dock in London, just by Tower Bridge. And I come mm-hmm. out and I go clockwise all the way around. And uh, I can't, can't get out of the boat until I finish. But what makes it particularly difficult with, with rowing around Great Britain 
is that you're constantly battling the tides and and you're constantly monitoring the weather because and you know you, you have to drop an anchor when you want to rest so when you're out in the atlantic or crossing any ocean if you don't want to row that's fine you're not going to hit anything you just let yeah. them drift whereas you can't do that when you're going around great britain you, you have to drop an anchor but you have to be in a place where it's safe to do that there's sections where there's not much you can you can come into marinas and drop an anchor in a marina but you okay. can't get out of the boat you can't take any support at all so how far off the coast do you normally row? it all depends really on on, on whereabouts i am but quite often right. close so for instance when i row you know past brighton you, you will literally you would be able to see me um, literally rowing past brighton pier and that, what about when you roll past my house at the northeast here? Well, who knows? That, exactly. <laughs> so if you're on the coast, you might be able to see me. So most of the time, I'll be rowing quite close. Um, and, and the really good thing about that is it means that I will still have 3G, 4G on my phone. For, that was my next question, that, social media. Exactly. Now that will open up another world of content that I can deliver. Like, sure. You know, updating YouTube videos, um, blogs you know every other day people will be able to track me and it's really cool because people tracking me you know i can put out on social media well actually i'm going to be rowing past this point tomorrow and people can come out and watch me row past and you see that makes it real when you clear off to the other side of the world rowing across the indian ocean or the pacific or whatever it's a huge achievement but you're so far removed from the uk that people can sort of lose sight of it. But here, it's real because you'll be able to come out and see me. Media can come out on, on, um, onto a boat and come and interview me and stuff. So I'm really looking forward to it. And you know, ultimately, the reason I'm doing this is I've got a wonderful, wonderful charity again that I'm working with. And that they're called Over the Wall. And they're based in Hampshire, but they operate throughout the UK. And they provide camps for, for families who have terminally ill children. And I've seen the work they do, and it's just awesome. And they're really doing some good stuff. So if I could go away and do something crazy and at the same time raise some good cash for them, I think that's a really good thing. So, yeah, watch this space in June uh, this year. So only a couple of months away. And and how long will that take you? I am hoping and estimating a couple of months. A couple of months. So I'll I'll be out at sea for a couple of months. Right, we need to keep an eye on that. Yeah, absolutely. We can do we can do some we can do some blogs and and some podcasts from li- literally on the boat. We can the <laughs> get <next in>. podcast <laughs> we do. We could do that on the boat. Wouldn't that be so cool? Right, let's do that. <laughs> we'll definitely do that. Well, that's brilliant for for over the wall. I'm sure they're super pleased. Yeah, they're they're happy. They're a great bunch of people who are trying to do some great things. So I am really pushing it hard for them. You know, yeah. it's difficult because sometimes people don't donate to charity and stuff it's difficult but actually most people can afford to donate 50p or a quid and just whack it on a just giving site so put a quid on the site and if every person who knew about my gb road did that or, or or i spoke to you'd raise a huge amount of money huge so yeah it's hoping we can really push it this year for them well, what we'll do, James, we'll put some show notes together and we'll link over to Over the Walls Just Given page and, and make sure that's on there. Yeah, that'd be super. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, and I know you're also going to give us some signed copies of your book as well to run a competition. That's yeah, great, thank you. No problem at all. I've got some. In fact, they're sat, they're sitting right in front of me. I'm looking at them now. So I'll get them signed up and uh, we'll get that sorted out. That's no problem at all. Brilliant stuff. And also in the show notes, James, we'll, we'll put all your links together. You've got jamesketchell.com, I think, or, or .co.uk, but we'll link to that. Yeah, .net, jamesketchell.net. Yeah. .net, I'll make sure that's linked. And also your Captain Ketch is your Twitter name, I think. Absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. There's a funny yeah. story behind that, actually. I, Go on, then. <laughs> I, I, will tell you, I, I will share it. I wanted, I, when I rode across the Atlantic, I did not have a Twitter account. So I thought, well, I better get one when I get home. I didn't really know anything about social media, about PR, about marketing when I first sort of embarked on my um, on my road. But but you quickly learn. So I realized when I got back, I needed to have a Twitter account. So I typed in James Ketchell and, and lo and behold, James Ketchell was taken. Now, this James Ketchell happens to be an extremely wealthy uh, multimillionaire entrepreneur. And I thought, oh, crikey, he's doing quite well. And uh, so I thought, well, he's got James Ketchell, so I can't have that. 
but um, everyone, pretty much everyone calls me Ketch for some reason. Uh, not many people call me James. But when I was in the boat, for a bit of a laugh, I, I was the only person, so making me the captain of the boat. I used to <laughs> sign my blogs off Captain Ketch, and that nick- nickname, Captain Ketch, just stuck, stuck like glue. And I thought, well, I wonder if the name Captain Ketch is available on Twitter. And sure enough, it was. So I thought, right, my Twitter handle is going to be Captain Ketch. And um, now everyone thinks, yeah, I quite often get emails or people are saying, so tell me, what, uh, what regiment did you serve with? You know, yeah. <laughs> for, for an actual you know, for real captain, if you like. And uh, I have to say, well, yeah, I, I actually wasn't. I was, well, I'm a nautical captain. That, that's 100% <laughs> accurate. But yeah, so the whole nickname of Captain Ketch came. It was quite funny. It just kind of happened. But um, yeah, I quite like it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> right, James. Well, look, we're, we're stuck for time. So I really appreciate that. And let's do something when you're on around the UK. That sounds awesome. I'd love to be brilliant. And hey, listen, thank you. Uh, for taking the time to to listen to me speak today. And and thank you to everyone who is listening to this. I I really appreciate it. And uh, at the end of the day, if I can go out there and do a few things, then now everyone else can go out there and and do whatever they want. It's just figure out what you want to do and and make it happen, really, I guess. Brilliant. Great place to leave it. Well, thanks for your time, James. No worries. Wow, how good was Captain Ketch? Right, competition time. There are a number of ways you can win a signed copy of James's book. I want you to contact me and tell me why you should win. There's a discussion in the LinkedIn group. There's a plug-in on the bottom of James's page on industryangel.com. There's a post on our Facebook page. Or you can drop me a line at host at industryangel.com. So there's lots of ways you can enter. We'll pick a winner and James will personalise it for you. And how good would it be? If we could all drop a quid or two to the Over the Wall Just Given page, that would be good. So until next time, I'm Ian Farrer, this is the Industry Angel, and thanks for listening.